let me welcome you all to our final series here with me brother daniel from streams of light ministries we are looking at the final response uh, we are responding to power of the lamb ministries we are in the final video i would ask that you go to the three uh, to the two other videos that are done in this three-part series and also check the description box as well as the comments i'll post a series which is a playlist which includes very short videos which were done covering this topic in its entirety so this is the part three we are looking at the mystery of god All right so this was the clip from the pastor which he made which initiated this response so let's listen the mystery of godliness is not god trying to get us to understand something that our minds can't even fathom eternity past what is that the mystery of godliness is god trying to help us to understand that god was manifest in the flesh and that the greatest mystery of all is the fact of jesus's existence as a man for 33 and a half years not Oh, did you know that before, way, way, way long, in a time that we can't even fathom, that Jesus was brought forth from the Father? All right, so there you have it. So this was a comment which, when it was said, it brought much sadness to me. So the mystery of Godness isn't what was there in the the reality that Christ is God's son is, is not the mystery of Godliness. Rather, his life on earth, only that is what is important for us to understand. So, I mean, th this, this, this is quite personal because this message is what brings salvation to us. What is the mystery of Godliness? So, if you have not watched part one, I would ask, please go watch part one and then watch this presentation so the mist i'll pick up from where we left off in part one so <clears throat> this is just um i'm just picking off in a story so if you didn't watch part one you might miss something but i'll try to recap so this is a recap from part one let's look at this romans 1 verse 3 says concerning his son jesus christ our lord which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, Romans 1 verse 4 says, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power at the resurrection. Okay? But if you watch part one, you understand that Christ was begotten twice. Once in eternity as the divine Son of God. The second time was in Bethlehem. If you read John 1 14, it's quite clear. In Bethlehem was begotten as the Son of God and the Son of Man. Right? And when he died, what happened? The third time he was begotten or raised back to life. And uh, this is what really happened. Acts 13, verse 33. So, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to go to the end. <clears throat> okay? I'm trying to go to the end of the story then what i'll do is i'll go back to the beginning of the story and then we'll go back to the middle <laughs> which is kind of like um uh, how we can understand this so we'll start with the end and then we'll go back to the beginning and then we'll go back to the middle of the story so what we are doing here now we are at the end so that we can understand the beginning and then we understand the middle. You understand as we go through the presentation. So, Acts 13, verse 33, uh, the fulfillment of it says, And God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus again. The word again is used. As it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son this day, I have, uh, have I begotten thee. So, when you read this, it is so clear that at the resurrection, Jesus was raised up again. It wasn't the first time. It was again. All right? So let's look at this. All right. So let's go to the fulfillment. If we go to the reality, our Psalms 2 verse 6 says, Yet have I set my king 
upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So, remember, the promise was Christ was going to be declared with power at the resurrection that he is the begotten son, right? Okay? And the fulfillment of it was says, I've raised him up again. So what happened at the resurrection? Well, Christ was set as a king upon God's holy hill Zion, meaning he was to be exalted and anointed as king. So the words, yet have I set, the word set, the Hebrew original is nakak, and it just means to anoint as king. Okay? Now remember that Acts said he raised it again. So this was not the first time Christ was anointed. There was another time when this was done. Let's look at it. Proverbs 8, verse 22. It says, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Verse 23, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning forever that was. So, Christ, in eternity, from everlasting, there was a beginning. And in that point, Nakak, he was set up the same word, the same Hebrew word. It just means to anoint as king. So, Christ, before he came to earth, he was anointed as king. Hmm? And then he came as a man and lived amongst us, offering a divine human life. And what happens? At the resurrection, he was anointed as king in his former glory. And actually, in his prayer, he, this is explained so beautifully. John 7, verse 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So Jesus says, Look, you have to glorify me with the glory I had with you. Before the world was. And what was this glory? We have seen it. Proverbs 8 verse 22. He was anointed as king. Right? So Christ was anointed as king. Before the world was. And when he came in time. He prayed that look. I need the glory again. And in reality. Psalms 2. Is the fulfillment of it. He was anointed again. So. We understand. Here we are back in time. So. Jesus says, look, glorify me with thine own self. And what is God's own self? Hmm? And what is this glory? Let's look at this. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 5, verse 1 and 5. It says, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Hebrews 5, 5 says, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. But he may say that, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten him. So this is speaking much about the resurrection. Christ was glorified and made into a priest. Now look at this. What is God's own self? Acts 2 verse 16 says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Acts 2 17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will part of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall, shall dream dreams. Acts 2 18 says, And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, they shall prophesy. So God's own self is his spirit. The spirit is the spirit of God. Hmm? That is so clear. You can't run away from that. So Christ was asking for God's own self so that he could be glorified. And guess what? Look at this. Acts 2 verse 32 is so clear. It says, And this Jesus has God raised up. Remember, it says God has raised up again. And this Jesus has God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. Verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. So, look at what has happened. In the very beginning. Okay, let's just look at what happened in Acts. In Acts, what has happened? Christ has authored a full human life. He's now in heaven. And there is an event where Christ's prayer will be answered. What does God do? God anoints Christ with his spirit. So that what? So that his promise spoken of by Joel could be fulfilled. Where the flesh, where the people of God, the servants of God, would have the spirit of God. And not just the Spirit of God, but now they could have salvation. So on Pentecost, the fulfillment was come. What happened? God's own self, His Spirit. What does He do with it? He anoints Christ. 
Why? Because now Christ has lived a righteous life which is victorious over sin and death. And this life is what is needed by you and me so that we can live. And so Christ, because he's now the father of our race, is enabled to give this life to you and me as a savior now. So which means this is the glory. Look at this. Let's, I mean, we have to read this. This is the glory which Christ says, I had with thee before the world was. So before the world was, what happened? Christ was anointed as king before the world was. He was anointed with God's spirit. And because of this, we shall see the reality, the mystery of godliness. We shall see it. It's so clear in the Bible. In the days of eternity, before everything else was, Christ, when he was begotten in eternity, Born of God, he was fully divine. He had that divine life. And he was anointed with God's spirit. We shall see that this is what happened. In salvation, what happens? Christ is born in time. He becomes a man. So he's born in time as the son of God. He's divine. And as the son of man, he has humanity. And he fulfills all the prophecies. And he's victorious. Guess what? At the resurrection, he is resurrected. He now has a glorified human body. He rises up, right? At the resurrection, he says he's begotten again, right? He rises up, and guess what happened? God glorifies him. So that the life that was in him can be given to you and me. And what he does on Pentecost is what he had in eternity. Only that in eternity, he didn't have that human experience. Do you see now? So now, we begin to understand. Remember I said we start at the end of the story, then we'll go back to the beginning, then we'll go to the middle. So now, what I want to do, I want us to go back to the beginning now. To understand more. When we say Christ is divine, what, what are we saying? Mark 10 verse 18. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. I mean, if you are talking about divinity, you are not talking about power. A few questions asked. We and Lucifer. Who has more power? Lucifer, by all means. Does that make him more divine? No. No. Is Does a divine being have power? Definitely. But that is not the understanding of divinity. Power, intelligence, Omniscience, all these things are expressions of divinity. But what is divinity? It's the goodness. Only the divine nature is good on its own. Only God is good. That's what Jesus is saying. And because Jesus is the Son of God, He's extremely good. He is very good. Amen. 1 John 4 8 says, He that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. When you talk about love, you're talking about divine being. We're talking about divinity. Only God is love. No need to command him. No need to instruct him. No need to put laws. No need to put restrictions. Only God is divine. Only God is divine. Revelation 15 verse 4 says, We shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name. For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. So only the Lord, only God is holy. Holiness is found in one place, and that is divinity. So if someone is looking for love, if someone is looking to be holy, if someone is looking to be good, who are they in reality trying to look for? Trying to look for the divine being. And we find out that this is true. This has been true throughout all time. And notice, Colossians 1 verse 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Christ is the image, the image, the reflection. Genesis 5, verse 1 to 4 says, Adam had a son in his image. And if, and if you look at this, if Adam had a son in his image, what does it mean? So you find that when Adam had a son, in his own image. It means it's a reflection of him. And if you look at this, if 
suffices the image of the visible God in his is 100% divine. In humanity, the image is not perfectly replicated, but in divinity, that image is 100%. So when we say only God is divine, only God is good, only God is holy, only God is righteous, we are saying Christ, because he's the image of God, he's 100% good, 100% loving, 100% holy. He's the firstborn, and because he's the firstborn, he's the firstborn of every creature, meaning to say, through him, everything else was created. Through Christ, everything was created. This is what he's trying to say. By virtue of his birth, creation brought its origins. Through Christ, God created everything. Caution 1 verse 16 says, For by him were all things created, and by him are that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominion or principalities, all powers, all things were created by him and for him. Notice, all things were created by him and for him. They were created for him. I mean, he enjoyed his loving. That's the, his expression. And by creating all things. Guess what? They were created for him. For his pleasure. Colossians 1 7, he says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Meaning to say, he upholds all things. He is divine. And that's why he, the Bible says he's the image of the visible. John 1 verse 1 is so clear. I will just go straight to verse 3. We looked at it in part 1. It says, All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. So all things were made by him. Meaning to say, he is the creator. God created all things through him. Huh? John 1 verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Which life is this? Read verse 3. It's that divine life. It's that divine life. And if you read John 1 verse 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning, there was a beginning when the word was with God. The word was with God. And the word, in the beginning was the word. Okay? And the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 3 says, The same was in the beginning with God. So you have God. Who is the Father? And then you have the Word. There was a beginning in which the Word was with God. And it is so clear. Right? So, let's look at this. Revelation 3 verse 14, it says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea is right. These things say, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Meaning, all creation began through Him. All creation began through Jesus Christ. He is truly the image, the only being to whom God said, let us make man in our image. There is no other being in the Bible, no one. Not even one verse speaking about a third or fourth or sixth being is in the image. Right? Humans were made in the image of God. But when God said, let us make man in our image, there was only one being, who is Christ. The one who had the beginning, the divine image in him. It was one uh, verse one three it talks about Christ, who is the image, likeness of the divinity. Revelation four eleven says, "Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created." What an amazing revelation! So we created for the pleasure of God. You, you ask yourself, we are to accept this divine message we are to accept the life that Christ has offered but what does God get out of it well God gets he's happy that we're with him he's happy this is this is so amazing and when we understand these things how were we created because we understand we are in sin so we have to understand how was it in the beginning well if you look at the resurrection it tells us how it will be in the end because the resurrection is a returning back to how it was in the beginning. So let's read 1 Corinthians 15 verse 42. It says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Verse 43. It is a sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is a sown in weakness. It is raised in power. So, in, when we die, it's like a seed. We, 
our bo- we die in Christ, our bodies are physical, they are having disease, they die, you know, they are put in the grave. But when they are raised, they are no longer raised in corruption. Do you see what the Bible is trying to say here? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, it says, It is sown a natural body. So mine right now is a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and then there is a spiritual body. Now, this is so clear. What we have today are natural bodies. But in the resurrection, we have spiritual bodies. And now my question is this. How shall you know that it is you who is born? Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, it says, The spirit of man when he dies goes back to him. To God who made him, whilst the body just turns back the way it came. Which means in the resurrection, my body is converted into a spiritual body. But how shall you tell it's me? Because my spirit, my life shall return back to this body. That's why I wanted us to look at it. So we understand that though someone can have a spiritual body, that body has to have that human spirit connected to it. Right? And because we have that at the resurrection, that life, that spirit is returned to a spiritual body, we shall have elevated bodies which are spiritual, but we shall behave and act in the same way because it's the same life. The life of Daniel be in Daniel's spiritual body. Let me. Do, I wanted that very important. So, just because someone has a spiritual body does not mean they have a spirit. It does doesn't mean that they don't have a spirit. That's what I want to say. The spiritual body is going to be animated because it has a spirit. That is very critical. Remember Christ when he arose from the dead. How did they recognize him? Remember. Christ walked when he arose from the dead. He had a spiritual body now. Because he could walk into a room with with the doors are opened and he could speak to them and just vanish in thin air. That's he he had abilities which he didn't have before. Because he was erected, he had a spiritual body. Hmm? And now I want to look at something very key. Let's look at this. Hebrews 1, verse 7. And of the angels. Remember, Jesus also said, In the resurrection, we shall be like the angels. Why? Because we have spiritual bodies. And in those spiritual bodies, some of the things that we have today, we end up getting married and all those things. Because we shall have spiritual bodies, we shall no longer be married. But we shall be as the angels. Right? So we shall have spiritual bodies as the angels. Okay? Remember? Let's look at this. Hebrews 1. Jesus said, In the resurrection, we shall neither marry nor be given to marry. Jesus said that. We shall neither marry nor be given to marriage, which means our bodies shall be like that of the angels because we shall have spiritual bodies. Now look at this, Hebrews 1 verse 7. It says, And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels a spirit and his ministers a form of fire? So angels, when they were made, were spirits. Hmm? That's 14. And they are, are they not all ministers and spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So later on, because of the fall of man, angels became ministers and spirits. But what I want to look at is this. Though they are ministering spirits, angels have a form. They have bodies. These bodies are spiritual bodies. And because of that, these bodies have to be animated. They have a life. They have an angelic spirit. Just like humans have human spirits, angels have spiritual bodies, which are spirits, but they have a life or they have an angelic spirit with that body so that it is animated. That's what I wanted to see. So that is very clear. Does the Bible suggest this? Yes, it does. And also, let's look at this. John 4 verse 24 says, God is a spirit. And let that worship him, must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is a spirit. But if you read the Bible, if you read the Bible physically, look at all the visions of God. Isaiah 6 verse 1 to 6. Even if you read uh, Daniel chapter... Uh, 7 from verse 10 to 14 or go to Revelation chapter 4 and read the visions of God look at uh, Stephen's vision when he looked up as he was being stoned what do you find there are descriptions of God that he has a form God has a body 
And this body is a spiritual body. Hmm? And not only that, though God has a body, he has a physical form. The Bible says we shall see him. If you go to Revelation 2 verse 1, it says, His servant shall see him, meaning he has a form. But despite God having a form, he has a spirit. He has a life, which we call a divine life. And the difference between us and God is this. For angels and even humans, our life is in our body. You understand? But for God's life, for God's spirit, it extends beyond his body. That's what I wanted to say. Romans 8 verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So there is one spirit, the spirit of God, and the spirit of Christ. There is one spirit, really, if you look at it. Because when Christ ascended, what happened? God anointed him with his spirit. Meaning when we are born again, we receive the spirit which has the life of Christ and the life of God. It's one spirit. And the dispensation of the spirit is quite key. God anoints Christ with the spirit. And from then, Christ is able to give the spirit to his servants. Remember? On Pentecost, he gave the spirit to his servants who were in the upper room. That's the that's how the spirit is given or dispensed. Okay, so that is so key. And in the days of eternity, guess what? If you read here, you understand that when God created all things through Christ, there was only one way there could be an eternal security. Every created being had to be filled with the spirit of God. And who created all things? It was Christ. Now let's read uh, the creation order. Let's look at the mystery of godliness in the beginning. In Ezekiel 28 verse 15, that was perfect in thy ways from the day that was created. In the name it was found in you. Now another word that can be used for perfect is good. Okay. Now we said only God is good, only God is love, only God is holy. And we saw that Christ is the son of God. And if Christ is the son of God, then we know by all means he's holy. He's loving, he's good. He's God, right? He is divine. Now, how was Lucifer created perfect? How was he created good? How did he have these abilities? Did he just have these divine abilities on his own? Well, let's look at Ezekiel 28, verse 4. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have said this so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou has walked up and down the midst of the stones. Now, here it's speaking about Lucifer. Lucifer is the anointed cherub. Now, anointed cherub meaning he's an anointed angel that covered. He was one of the angels which covered the glory of God. Now, the, the, the other question you can ask is, when you say anointed, so looking at Ezekiel 28, verse 15 and 14, we begin to um, connect the two. Lucifer was created perfect, and this goes on not only for him, but all the angels that he created, right? He was perfect. Why was he perfect? He was anointed. So if you tie in the two verses, you begin to see him being anointed meant he was created perfect. That's what made him perfect. Okay? Now, if you go to Acts 10, verse 38, what does being anointed mean? Uh, how God anointed Jesus was Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Right? So, um, understanding all these things, you understand that when Christ came on earth, God anointed him in a special way to act out his role as our Savior, right? He was anointed with Father's Spirit. And he lived out his life in Egypt. So, now, one thing I want us to look at here is this. When you begin to understand that in the beginning, when God created all things perfect, okay? When God was creating all things, he created them through his son. And everything was perfect. What made everything perfect? is because God's spirit was poured out on this creature. So, when God created all things through Christ, the Spirit of God, when, when God created all things through Christ, as soon as the creation was done, 
as soon as the moment Lucifer created, what happened? The Spirit of God was poured out in him. So Lucifer had the Spirit of God in him. And that's why it says he was an anointed cherub. He was anointed with the Spirit. And that's what made him perfect. This was the mystery of godliness. Hope you understand. So, and if you understand uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 18, it says, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thy iniquity, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth, in the sight of all them that behold thee. So, we understand something very clear here. To say that, when you talk about angels, speaking about Lucifer and the angels, what happened to Lucifer? He defiled his sanctuaries. Another word for sanctuary is temple. Okay? And what is the temple for? The temple is the dwelling place of deity. The Bible actually tells us. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 16 it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of the living God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Well, there you have it. So, Lucifer, when he was created, he was a temple. He was a sanctuary where the Spirit of God dwells. He was anointed, he was perfect. So we have the reality. All the angels were anointed. They were perfect. They were the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. And that's how creation happened. And we find that everything also is built. And if you look at it, Ezekiel 28 verse 12, it says, Son of man, take up a lamentation up upon the king of Ty, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sayest of the Son, full of wisdom, and perfect in good. Well, Ezekiel 28, uh, it's a contrast. It speaks about the king of Tyre, yes, but in reality, it's actually speaking about Lucifer because it says you have been in Eden. The king of Tyre was not in Eden. Okay? It's just like speaking about the lamb, but in reality, it's speaking about Christ. So it says you are full of wisdom and perfect in good. Was Lucifer wise? When he was created, what made him to be so wise? Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. So Lucifer was full of wisdom, and the Bible actually says he understands more than Daniel. So his understanding was 100%. His wisdom was full. Why? Because he was filled with the Spirit of God. When Christ created all things in the beginning, Christ filled the angels with the Spirit of God. They were anointed by Christ himself. So it's so clear, just as at Pentecost, what happened? When he had offered a new human life to save us, what did God do? He was anointed and he gave that life to us. So in the beginning, the glory that Christ had before the world was, he was anointed as God's king. And when God created all things through Christ, what happened? God, in that moment, gave him that gift. And Christ now can anoint all created beings with the Spirit of God. And because of that, they are perfect, they are good, they are full of wisdom. And what does it mean to be perfect in good? Well, Psalms 96 verse 6 says, Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Verse 9 says, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him. For him. So, when you talk about the beauty of holiness, Remember, only God is holy. How were the angels holy? They were filled with his spirit. And that, what, that is what made them to be holy. So the angels were holy because they were filled with the spirit of God. And they served him in holiness. It is so amazing when you begin to understand the mystery of godliness. Everything else comes to light. And we read this, Ezekiel 20, verse 14. Read it again. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have said this so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the storms of fire. So, Lucifer was anointed cherub. He was walking upon the holy mountain of God, in the midst of the storms of fire. What is this holy mountain of God? What is this all about? Hebrews 12, verse 22, it says, But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And to an innumerable company of angels, Hebrews 12, verse 23 says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect. So, you understand that 
the reality here is so so amazing we have Mount Zion. It's the city of the living God. And what is so special about Mount Zion? It, there is an innumerable camp of angels. You see that? So, Lucifer was on the holy mount of God. In reality, this mount is the city of the living God. Right? And what is this? What is this? Verse 22. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. When we pray today, we don't look to Jerusalem. That's actually the context of Hebrews 12, verse 22. We don't look to Jerusalem in Palestine, but we look to heaven where our spirits are made just and perfect. As Lucifer was perfect in the beginning. And we understand that when you are born again, your spirit is joined to God's spirit. 1 Corinthians 6 17 says, He is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Our spirit is changed in the new birth. Yes. And one thing remains the character. Our character becomes to be molded by the spirit. Uh, but we know Revelation 7, verse 3 says, The seal will be placed in the forehead in the last vestiges of the memories of sin will be removed. And God's people will go into the crisis. Right? That's another study. But we find something beautiful here. To say that Lucifer was in this holy mount of God. He was part of the congregation. He was part of the church. And church can only be where the Spirit of God is. They were all filled with the Spirit of God. That's the reality. Who did that? It was Christ. It was Christ. And now, look what happened. Isaiah 14, verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the king? How art thou cut down to the ground? Which did weaken the nations. Remember, Lucifer defiled his sanctuary. What made him to have sin? Right? Was something come upon him? Something suddenly seized him? What was it that made him to defile the sanctuary? Because once he defiled his sanctuary, the Spirit of God could no longer be in him. And what happened? Sin happened. Sin is the separation from God. And once he divorced himself from God's Spirit, his beauty of holiness left him. His holiness left him. His righteousness left him. And that was left. There was no goodness. There was no holiness. There was no love. He became a thief, a healer. And a He became Savior. And actually, this is what it is. Isaiah 14, verse 10, says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mountain of congregation in the sides of the north. Right? Remember, Zion is in the sun in the north. So it's a reference to that. Um, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. There was only one person who was the divine image. Who was like God. And that is Christ. And Satan waged a war upon Christ. The, the thing was, Lucifer wanted to create an alternative righteousness. Where he can be good without God. That was the issue. Goodness without God. And in the end... In trying to improve upon God's government, he said. And that was the issue in the rebellion. He rebelled against Christ. He rebelled against the head of the church in heaven, the church of the first. And if you look at this, Ephesians 3, verse 14 to 15 says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named. So there is a family in heaven. Family on earth, and the head of the church, head of the family, is Christ. The church in heaven is Christ. The church on earth is Christ. And you know what? Because of this rebellion, there was need to clarify some of the doubts that were granted by Lucifer. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 13, it says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ. So the head of the woman is the man. That is so key. And the head of Christ is God. Right? Alright? So, this was done. Why? 1 Corinthians 11 verse 9 says, Neither was the man created for the woman, and the woman for the man. Verse 10 says, For this cause out the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. So, the woman was supposed to have power on her head because of the angels. Why? Because the angels have just witnessed something 
insidious, something evil. It's suggesting that the, the government of God is weaker than the government of sin. So Lucifer began to infuse his ideas. And we know that many angels also followed in his foolish pursuit. It sounded intelligent. You say angels can govern themselves without speed of independent of God. And in the end, they ended up in bondage. And, and God says, no, 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 no. I'll create a parable for them. In love, God created man in his image. Why? For the angels. The angels had to see. The angels had to know. They had to know something. And, you know, if you look at Galatians 1.26, it says, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that moveth on the earth. So, God says, look, let us make man in our image. Okay? Who is God speaking to? Well, there's only one other person he can speak to. Let's look at Hebrews 1 verse 2. It tells us who God was speaking to. How these in, in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Alright? Let's continue. Hebrews 1 verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself finished our sins, sat down on the right hand of the mighty son high. So it is so clear here. Hmm? It is so clear. There's only one being in the universe who is the express image of his person. When God said, let us make man in our image, he spoke to this being. This being is none other than Jesus Christ. So God spoke to his son and said, listen, let us. So God spoke to his son, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. So when God was creating Adam and Eve, he was made in such a way to reflect that divine image. Let's go to Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him. Male and female created he them. All right, now, there are a few things you have to understand. Genesis 2 verse 22. It is so clear. It says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he woman. And he brought her unto the man. So we understand that God created Adam first. Adam was created from the dust of the ground. But Eve was not created from the dust. Eve was brought forth or begotten from the man. To show, to show clearly that we have God who is divine. Right? And from him another being was brought forth who is Christ. And as Adam is a man, Adam is fully human, so we have Eve. Because she comes from the man, she is fully human. Do you see now? So it was so amazing. And Adam was to be the head of the woman because he was first, just as the father is the head of Jesus Christ. is the head of the son. They are of the same nature. They are of the same substance because Eve came from the man. You see? So that was the first thing, the first scenario. And another amazing thing that we must understand that this was done because of angels. Adam first, then Eve. Notice, something came from Adam that produced. Remember, there was a church in heaven full of the congregation of angels, right? So you have that from Adam, right? Came what? Eve. Without Adam, no Eve. So it is the same thing. Because of Christ, the church consists. Okay? Because of something had to come from Christ, who is Adam? Remember, Christ is the second Adam. He bring forth the church, which was in heaven, right? Through Christ, the angelic host was formed, and it was Adam is human, right? It is human. So, because Christ is a holy, something from Him was taken to make all these angels holy. His spirit. Now, maybe that might not make sense, but let us look at it from our perspective. Adam was put to sleep. And what did what did happen? When he was put to sleep, a woman was brought forth. Okay? Right? Now, in salvation, who was put to sleep? Christ actually died. He, he slept on the cross. Died. And when he arose, what happened? He was anointed. 
and something came from him. The life. Remember, what happened at the cross? There was blood from his side and water. Um, John 7, verse 37 39. Water represents the Holy Spirit. So I find that the spirit for which Christ was anointed gave birth to the church. So from Adam, a real woman, from Christ, something is coming, the spirit, and then the church is being exalted. So from Christ, the church has its being. So Christ is the head of the church. So these were some of the parables why God made it like that. Okay? And you know what? This was so amazing to the angels. To us, we understand it that it was when sin, but to the angels, they understood it in a very amazing way to say, you know what? Christ is fully divine as his father. All that he is because of it. They understood that God is the head of Christ. And Christ is fully divine. Right? And let us look at Job 38, verse 4. It says, Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou hast understand. Okay? Let's look at the uh, Chapter 38, verse 7 says, When the morning stars are sung together, and the, all the sons of the Lord started to pray. So, you know that Lucifer is one of the morning stars. And all the stars, when the angels saw this creation order, they were so amazed, they were blown away. Can you imagine? There was this great controversy. Lucifer is hurling accusations, and God makes this Adam. And it's a reflection of the Father and His Son. And an even more amazing reflection of Christ in his headship over the, over the church. Two lessons, one creation. And the angels were amazed. And you know what? Because of this controversy, God did something. I always ask, why, why did Lucifer rebel? You know what? God, for the security of the universe, God made it so that everyone was filled with his spirit. Christ anointed all created orders of being. Spirit. Okay, so God did something, something that was almost like a risk because you know the happiness of the universe can only be maintained if everyone had a free choice, if everyone had freedom. So, even when Lucifer was created perfect, he was anointed with the spirit, uh, together with all the other angels, that was for the eternal security so that no evil comes in. But a risk had to be put because even the happiness of the created being had to be sacrificed. So God gave each and every one free will. So for the security of the universe, God made sure that all created beings were filled with the spirit. That's the security of the universe. But for the security of the happiness of the inhabitants of the universe, God gave each one power of free will. And Lucifer abused that power. And he ended up becoming Lucifer. Not only that, he abused his power further by deceiving humanity. Now notice in Genesis 2 verse 9, it says, And out of the ground he made the Lord go to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And guess what God did? Genesis 2 16 says, And the Lord God commanded a man saying, Of every tree in the garden thou mayest freely eat. Verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we have two trees here. It's just a summary of two governments, two legacies. One is the tree of life, meaning to say, Adam and Eve were created perfect. Remember, Genesis 1 ends, and God saw all that he created, and it was very good. What made it to be very good? Adam and Eve were filled with the Spirit of God. They were good from the beginning. In other words, they were perfect. They were holy. They were beautiful. Right? And we, we find that this was the reality. One government where Adam and Eve were filled with the Spirit. And they had the ability to be guided with the Spirit, to live perfect holy lives. And another government which was represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whereby God is not that important. You just need knowledge to know which is good. And which is evil and obvious if you are wise you choose the good that was satan's government but god's government was being filled with the life having infused in you the life of the deity the life of god right and with that 
guess what? They had the powerful choice, and they made the wrong choice, and the sin came over humanity. But even then, there was a contagious system that God made, the system where they worshipped in the shadows. Exodus 25 verse 8, remember in the wilderness, God said, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's 22. Now, remember God, because of sin, could no longer dwell in the people. Right? God made a system to say, this is a shadow. Make a sanctuary. Remember, the people were originally the, the temple of the spirit. But due to sin, that ceased. And God says, listen, make me a sanctuary. I want to teach you something. I've brought you out of sin. I want to show you something. This is your reality. Okay? Make me a sanctuary so that I can dwell among you. You see? So God is actually making a physical, uh, tell them, make a physical sanctuary so that he can dwell among the congregation. How? He will put his presence in that thing. But this is just a shadow. The reality is people are the ones within whom the Spirit of God is supposed to be put. That's the reality. And very few people in the old covenant understood this. Very few were filled with the Spirit of God. Exodus 25, verse 22 says, And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubs, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I will give thee in, in the commandment unto the children of Israel. So you find that in the type, God says, Listen, make me a sanctuary. And in that sanctuary, when you build that Ark of the Covenant and put it together, put it in the most holy place, I will be meeting with you in that place. Meaning to say when Moses went into the temple, God will speak to him. Now, if, if it's true that we are the temple of the living God, then the reality is God dwells in us, as we shall see. And if he dwells in us, guess what? We can commune with him because his presence is between you and me. And look at this, John 2 verse 19, Jesus actually... When he came, the first thing that he spoke about was this. John 2, 19, he says, Jesus answered, this is the truth, this is the reality, worshiping in realities now, the truth. Jesus answered, John 2, 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in a few days I will raise it up. And the Jews, verse 20, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and would that build it up in three days? Verse 21, But he spake of the temple of his body. Right? That's why in Acts 10, verse 38, we read it earlier. It says, How God anointed Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and with power. So Jesus understood the reality. He came forth to show what the reality is. What is the kingdom of God about? Remember, the fight in heaven was about God's kingdom. Right? Who is, who is, who is, whose kingdom is better? Lucifer said, No, I'll put my throne above God's throne. My, my kingdom is better. But Jesus says, No, 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 listen. You can't be like the Most High. You can't. Only his kingdom is better. So Jesus said, the first thing he came, you, um, uh, the body is the temple. That was the first truth that it came. And with this truth, he preached something so connected to this truth. Let's look at it. The redemption is the return to the original plan. Look at what John the Baptist did, the forerunner for Christ. Matthew 3 verse 1 says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness. What was he preaching? The, uh, verse 2 says, And saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, John was preaching repentance. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what was this kingdom? Jesus preached the same thing. Matthew 4, 7, he says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, look, this was saturated. John preached heavily, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached heavily, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this message, you know what? It was not only preached by these two. Jesus sent out... His disciples, Matthew 10, 6 says, But go ye rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, verse 7, and as you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. This was a message that was so clear. What is it about the kingdom that they were preaching? That it took 100% of the time and 100% of the content that they were preaching. Luke 17, verse 20. What happened? People had heard it and they wanted a reply. They thought the kingdom of heaven meant, you know, the subjugation of the nations under Israel. You know, Israel reigning as dominant. That's what they thought. But Jesus gave a different reply. Verse 20, uh, Luke 17, verse 20, he says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them, 
it says, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Rest on God. Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or Lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Do you see that one? Do you see that? So clear cut. Jesus says, Listen, the kingdom of God is within you. You are the temple. And by you having the Spirit of God, you have the kingdom of God within you. <laughs> Amazing. As it was in eternity, what Lucifer had caused the greatest upset, leading to the loss of countless angels, leading to the loss of the human race. Jesus said, No, I am the my body is the temple, and the spirit of God is within you. And this is the reality, this is the mystery of godliness. Divinity within the flesh. The spirit of God to be our flesh. This was what Jesus was preaching. Luke 19, verse 12. And he said, Listen. And he said, therefore, he said, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And if you look at it, Luke 19, from verse 11 going downwards, they thought because he's near Jerusalem, the kingdom of God should come. So he said, no, 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 listen, the kingdom of God is as a nobleman. He goes to a far country to receive the kingdom for himself and then to return. We shall see that on Pentecost, that's when the kingdom of God was inaugurated, when Christ had offered a human life, sorry, when Christ had offered a human life and he went to heaven, God anointed him with the Spirit. And guess what happened? He received himself a kingdom. And since Pentecost to today, we have the kingdom of God within us. And then Christ will return from that far country. He will return from home to take us home. This is the reality. But there are things that have to happen in between before he comes back. Matthew 13, verse 13. Speaking more of this, he says, Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Now, when you talk about the kingdom of God, he says a meal. Meal is something that they will use. If you grind something, you make a meal, right? They will use it to bake and so on. So he says, look, if you take leaven and put it in a meal, that's the kingdom of God. The whole thing will be leavened. And what does leaven do? Leaven causes something to rise. Something was supposed to happen to the meal. Something was supposed to happen to Christ. The life that was in him, when he offered it as a human, right? The divine human son, right? When that life was offered in him, that something was supposed to happen to him. Living was supposed to be added so that the life or the bread rises. The life was supposed to go beyond him. The life that he offered was not only to remain in him, but it was supposed to increase to you and me. The bread with Christ was supposed to increase. And this is what Jesus prayed. John 17, verse 5, it says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So Jesus said, Listen, glorify me with the glory I had with thee before the world was. Something was supposed to happen to the meal, that the whole of it is in. And sure enough, we read this already. Acts 2, verse 15, on the day of Pentecost, what happened? And it shall come to pass, uh, Acts 2, verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Saith God, I'll part of my spirit upon our flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Verse 18. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will part in those days of my spirit. They shall prophesy. So the reality here we find is that God wanted to establish the kingdom back on earth. And it was established when? In Pentecost. Acts 2, verse 32. The redemption reality. No longer in temples made with hands, but with the human temple, the body. Humanity turned back to God. Acts 2 verse 32 says, This Jesus has God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. Uh, Acts 2 verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now hear and see, which you now see and hear. So, what we understand is that throughout the whole Old Testament there were people who were filled with the Spirit we know Samson was filled with the Spirit we know about Moses, we know about Elijah, Elisha and all these men, right? but the thing that we must understand is this <coughs> there was not that human life of Christ within it and that human life of Christ that victorious life is the one that saves I hope you get the point right? and if we look at this so we find that there were people, <clears throat> right, who were even in heaven. You see, 
on, on, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah came to encourage Christ. Was Christ needed to fulfill something? Right? So I understand that there was something that had to be made available with Christ. Throughout the old covenant, you find that there were people who were filled with the Spirit of God. And in it, we had the presence of God and His Son, right? But what humanity needed was a righteous human life to have a new father of our race, to have a new Adam. And this is actually what is spoken about if you read the Bible. Hebrews 11, verse 39 says, All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. In this chapter, they talk about Enoch, Moses, Elijah, and all the rest. What was the promise? What was the promise? Hebrews 11, verse 40. God having provided something better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. <clears throat> the perfection of the Spirit, the perfection of being born of Christ, the second Adam. This reality kicked in on Pentecost. And this is what ushered in a new phase, and it is what we call the kingdom of God. <clears throat> this was what was there with all the holy angels. They are led by the Spirit of God. And now the sons of Adam, they purchased, and now they become the sons of the second Adam, Christ. And now they can live a holy life. They can receive this new life, this amazing gift. Hebrews 12 verse 28 says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may save God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So, we know that the kingdom that we have received now is the kingdom of grace. And we can't be moved. Once we realize, realize this, we have the kingdom of grace. <clears throat> and uh, we have what we call the redemption reality. And actually, this is what Christ came to do. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And what does the Bible define it as? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, sin of angels, Preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the word, received up in him. And that was what Christ was. And we are not asked to repeat what Jesus said, to exert effort to repeat this. No. We are told to believe and receive. When you receive Christ, the mystery of Godliness begins to happen again. Meaning to say, we receive that divine life. The life that is having the fullness of Christ's victory, the fullness of his victory over death and sin, is with us, and this is the presence of the Father. And this is what we call the Comforter. This is what we call the Second Adam. And when we receive this, what happens? Divinity is manifested in the flesh, and we are justified in the Spirit. Our spirits are made perfect. And what happens? We can preach. And what happens? When he comes, it shall be as he is. So that's the mystery of Godliness. That is the reality. Colossians 1.26 says, Even the mystery which was which has been hid from ages and from generations, and but now is made manifest to his saints. Verse 27. To whom God will make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is this mystery that is preached unto the Gentiles? Which is Christ in you, the hope of see so the reality is Christ in you that is the kingdom of God Christ in you that is the only hope of glory 1 John 3 verse 22 it's okay it says and whatsoever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight and what's his commandment verse 23 and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us a commandment well how shall we do that? Shall we exert so much force? Verse 24. And he that believeth, and he that keepeth his commandments, dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abides in us by the spirit which he has given us. And now, because we have received this kingdom, we have received the spirit, he abides in us. That is the mystery of godliness. Christ exemplified. He was a prototype. He was the temple. He said, look, the kingdom of God is within you. He was the prototype. And all those who are sons of the second Adam, Christ, they have unity in them. They have the divine life. 
partakers of the divine nature. Peter said. Ephesians 1 verse 9 says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has favored in him. Ephesians 1 verse 9 says, That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Which, which, which things? Both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. So all things are gathered together. The kingdom of God was established at Pentecost. But it has been there in heaven since the creation of angels. It has been there. And they had the spirit of God. They still have the spirit of God till then. But humanity was lost. But in Christ, God was trying to reconcile all things to himself. He's trying to bring us all to one place where the earthly family which was lost can also be brought back to his kingdom. This was the this was the issue. And if you read, guess what? What, what do angels call us? Revelation 22, they said, it says, And I John saw these things and I heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me this thing. Verse 9 says, Then saith he unto them, See that do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. Now, the angel says, I am thy fellow servant. Now, I just want us to be brought back to certain verse. Um, look here. Acts 2. Verse 2. And my, speaking about the praying out of the spirit, and on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall. So, God is saying on his servants he will pour out spirit. And we know that happened on Pentecost. Now, it just is amazing. If you look at here, what does the angel say? The angel says, I am thy fellow servant. Do you see that? We need to say, we and angels are fellow servants because we are all part of the same kingdom and we worship the same God. Actually, John was saying amazing things. He was so formed, he just wanted to worship. I mean, he was overwhelmed. And then you say, hey, don't do it. We are fellow servants. And I am a fellow servant of thy brethren. Worship God. Do you see that? That is so amazing. Angels worship God. Look, read it in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. They worship God and his son. And those who are filled with his spirit are fellow servants. We are part of the same kingdom. You see that? So this is the redemption's reality. This is the mystery of godliness. And if you, if you understand... Now we can read these things and understand them. John 18 verse 36. And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. In my kingdom, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. You see? Again, the word servants. That I should not deliver to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from thence. So Jesus says, look, my kingdom is not, it doesn't operate on this world. Remember when Joseph was testing um, Christ, he said, listen, just bow to him, I'll give you, I'll give you all these things. So meaning to say, this kingdom currently, because God gave dominion to Adam, and Adam lost to Satan. Satan claimed it as his. And now, we find that this kingdom operates on knowledge. Those people who have more knowledge are the ones who excel in this kingdom. A kingdom where people ask, but he's educated, why is he doing this? Because people think, if someone is educated, then they are more able. People will trust someone who's educated and they say, I evolution is true. Why? Because they're educated. It's, it's the kingdom of this world. It operates based on laws to enforce morality and penalties to enforce people and education to try to bring the morals of people up. But there is no God there. So, Jesus says, that my kingdom is not of this world. But something is to happen. And the mystery of God is finished. When it is demonstrated to the whole universe that there is only one kingdom which can work. And let me say this. At the cross, it was demonstrated that only God is love. That debate is settled. But in as far as the kingdom, the kingdom has to be first established and it proven that it's the only kingdom that can work. Guess what? And this will be Revelation 10 verse 17. Uh, Revelation 10 verse 7, it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. As he has declared, 
7 so far. When shall the mystery of God be finished? If you look at Revelation 7 verse 3, when God sees his people, the forehead, right? If you look at Ephesians 1 verse 13 or Ephesians 4 verse 30, it talks about the seal being the spirit. When God's people are sealed at the last moment in time, when the last vestiges of sin are removed from the memory, guess what? They will shine forth and they will exemplify the kingdom like no other person. And it will be so clear and the mystery of God will be finished. What Christ did be fully, fully shown. And what is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast is pretty much a system whereby God is not there. And if God is not there, you need to educate the people. And if God is not there, you need to enforce the people. You need to put stringent laws so that even the most carnal mind can bend to them. That's what is the mark of the beast. So we have the Spirit of God sealing those people, God sealing his people, not only in the spirit, but also in the mind, the character completely sealed. Oh God. And you have another side people who are fruits of Satan's kingdom. Two kingdoms running parallel at the end of time. And it will be shown truly that it is only God's kingdom. And the mystery of God is finished. The whole universe will declare the same. Ah, guess what will be the declaration? Revelation 11, verse 15, he says, And the seventh angel sounded. And there were great voices in heaven, all of heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Meaning to say, this is the end of the controversy. This is the end of sin. It's over. It's done. It's sin. There's only one way people can live righteous. Only one kingdom which can create people fit for eternity. Only one. And that is Christ's kingdom. This is the mystery of godliness. And will be brought back to how it was in eternity. And with this, there will not be any other affliction. Affliction don't rise up a second time. So this has been our message. I plead with my brother, aside from Ayas, to consider the evidence presented in this uh, part series and to come to the realization that Christ is indeed the Son of God and to worship and to have this mystery of Godliness. I have been with you, Brother Daniel. Uh, you can check us up on YouTube, Streams of Light Studies. Subscribe as well, like the video so that more people can have these videos accessible. Thank you so much for following. May God bless you. In Jesus' name.